Hi, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for joining us for the final webinar in UTJ's series of high holiday related programs with Rabbi Moshe Weisblum presenting on lessons from Kohelet. Please note that this program is being recorded. Also, everyone is muted, but we welcome thoughts and comments and questions in the chat, and we'll do our best to address questions at the end. My name is Scott Kalmakoff, and I am the coordinator for the Union for Traditional Judaism. Before we begin, I just have a few remarks and notes. Thank you to our sponsors for this program. I'll be sending their names in the chat shortly. I'd also like to thank everyone who made a donation along with the registering for this program. For those of you who are new to UTJ, let me add a few words of introduction to our organization. The Union for Traditional Judaism, the UTJ, is a group of rabbis, scholars, and lay people who advocate for a passionate, open-minded -mind approach to Torah study and observance of Jewish law rooted in classical religious sources and informed by modern scholarship. Our philosophy is distinguished by the symbiotic relationship between faith and the God-given Torah and intellectual integrity, and our emphasis on the sacred framework of halakha, Jewish law, as our unifying guide. Finally, let me introduce our speaker, Rabbi Moshe Weisblum. Rabbi Moshe Weisblum, PhD, is a 14th generation rabbi in his family's dynasty of rabbinical leaders. His ancestor was the famous Rabbi Eli Melech Weisblum of Lezhensk, one of the founding rabbis of the Hasidic movement. Rabbi Weisblum studied at Yeshivat Torah Emet in Haifa, at Yeshivat Itri, and at Yeshivat Or Etzion. He earned a master's degree in public administration from Fairleigh Dickinson University in New Jersey, and a PhD in philosophy from Baltimore Hebrew University. Rabbi Weisblum served as a consultant on Middle Eastern affairs in Washington, D.C., and has been on numerous TV talk shows commenting on social and political issues. He is a member of the New York and New Jersey Board of Rabbis, UTJ's Morasha Rabbinic Fellowship, as well as many other academic and rabbinic organizations. Rabbi Weisblum, I'm turning it over to you. Thank you, Moadim Lesimcha, Hag Sameach. I uh, want to express first and foremost my uh, tremendous gratitude to Hashem and to all the fellow Talmidei Chachamim and the Rabbanim that we are so fortunate to be part with. I'm a proud member of uh, this Moasha Fellowship for soon to be 30 years. Remember the years that I have the privilege to chat with Rabbi Halivni, may rest in peace, and many other G'dolei Torah that was involved with the organizations over the year. I'm um, proud and happy to uh, share some reflection and thought on this topic, and I welcome anyone to interject and ask and more. Um, Book of Kohelet, unfortunately, by many scholars, not only Jewish scholars, but many scholars totally misconstrued. People sometimes um, express the Ecclesiastic Kohelet as a, almost a depressive writings. Over the years, I can attest to the fact that this is one of the absolutely great, fascinating uh, book I've ever written. And obviously, not only for the Jewish faith, but many other faith will hold the highest um, regards to these beautiful writings. If we try to summarize the book, it's about human life. It's about goodness, about wisdom, compassion, and good common sense. One of the ideas that the rabbis argue with the regards to the book is the people may be misconstrued, people may misunderstand the concept of how come the book is so much tension and so many contradictions, because in one place he is for money, in another place he opposed money. In one place he said that everything is vanity, in another place he said that you should value life, and the list go on and on and on. So because there are so many tension and contradictions, the rabbis and Sheikh Neset Agdullah, Chazal, the men of the great assembly, and over the years, the rabbis have a big discussion if this book should be incorporated in our Tanakh, in our canon. As you know, that there are 24 books in the Tanakh, and this is one of the books that 
categorized almost as a philosophy book. The truth is there are two books in the Tanakh that you may call it Jewish philosophy or theology. The book of Job and the book of Kohelet, Ecclesiastes. Now, we do not think that Judaism is about philosophy. We do not think that Judaism is about searching what's the story of creation, what exactly happened to God's world and how the Almighty created us or created the world. Judaism is more about human behavior, how and why people behave the way they behave. And that's the centerpiece of the book of Kohelet. So eventually the rabbi said that with all the fear that it may create heresy or a lot of confusion, they decided not only to put it together and incorporate it in Kitveya Kodesh in the holy text, but they also put it as a part of the five Megillot, the five scrolls that we have the privilege to read during our important festivals. Festival of Sukkot, right after the day of remembrance, day of judgment, day of atonement. This is the time that some of us may feel married and relief and it may cause us to go astray. This book put the balance and give us a direction what we should do in our gift of the new year, of the new life. So what about Kohelet himself? Kohelet is one of the names of King Solomon, son of King David and Bathsheba. And King Solomon, he was one part of his life, early part, you can call it the silver spoon kid, wealthy family, kids that came from wealthy family and built the gorgeous, beautiful, holy Beit HaMikdash. So he experienced not just wealth, but tremendous wealth. Then it was another phase in his life. Either it happens without his initiation or with his initiation, it's a big question, but the bottom line is one part of his life, he was wealthy, then another part, he was a pauper, indigent, very poor. And then later on, close to the end, he gained again the wealth. And obviously a person that inherited something from his dad and grandparents versus a person that had nothing versus the person that gained it again is a totally different view of life. So the first phase of this talk, I would like to share with you the idea of wealth by the book of Kohelet. This is a very common subject, money, and how people treat money and what the Judaism, uh, not only approach to wealth, but how Judaism treats a different category of wealth. And because the view of wealth is so different, the view of the wealthy versus the view of those who are very poor, there are contradictions in the book. In one part of the book, he condemned wealth, another part of the book is for wealth. So the rabbis overall in their way of hermeneutic, meaning a commentary of the book, they saw the symptom, not the cause, which means money in a simple language is not the person. Money is in one of the way that revealed the person himself, herself to us. Hazal, our rabbi, tells us, there are three ways to recognize the character of a person. Bekoso, the way that he or she eats. Bekiso, the way they treated money. Ubekaso, when they get angry. So, in that sense, money is almost like a mirror, is like a window. How the person see himself, herself, and how we can perceptualize the person. And therefore, we ourselves sometimes appear ostensibly as people of contradictions. But when it's all said and done, King Solomon asks a basic question. 
What's the purpose of your life? Why you are here? Why are you living in this world? If a person only think about money and uh, the goal is money itself, then is one attitude just to be a workaholic or just to focus on the money for the entire lives. If the persons have other values, how that match with his or her basic needs. So um, he started by saying in the early chapters, chapter two and chapter five, he said, Kanastili, Gamkesev, Zahab, I accumulated, it was a part of my early life that I accumulated a lot of silver and gold and money. And as you know, we cannot eat money, right? So money by itself is almost meaningless. What you do with that, it's another story. I'm sure you're familiar with the um, families like Rothschild. Okay, so they, they to try to perpetuate the wealth from one generation to the next, but you need just set along the lines, seven, eight generations later, one executive decision that was totally wrong, that the whole wealth and the whole company and the whole accumulations of wealth can be downhill. Um, in the biblical Korah, the famous name in the book of Bamidbar, book of Numbers, that challenged the leadership of Moses. So the, the Gemara, the Talmud said, Kol beraglehem. whatever the people are, the entire universe, whatever people stand on it. So the Gemara said, the Talmud said, hamamon shema'amid adam al raglav. That's the money that creates a situation a person can stand on his or her. What does that mean? People, as a very essential part of life, need the wealth, need the money. But the question is, what exactly transpired through our ancestors? What's the message of wealth itself? Well, then let's start with the generation of the desert. Our people were wandering the desert. We left Egypt, went 40 years in the desert. I'm sure you're familiar with the story. Now let's think together. In the desert, there is no mall. There is no shopping center, right? There's no supermarket, there's no canyon. Yet, when they ask to bring money for the Mishkan, for the tabernacle, all of a sudden, there's money available. When Aaron asked people in the story of the golden calf, right? I need some parts, some golden, some, all of a sudden, they have money for the egg, as I have, they have money. They have gold and silver to create the golden can. So money itself, as we said, cannot do anything. But money, our Torah in the rabbinic writing in the book of Kohelet tells us, can be even in a negative way, a curse. Money can be a blessing and money can be a so destructive. I don't need to tell you so many stories of people who won lottery and that was the worst day of their lives. From that point, everything went downhill. So it is a very dynamic point of what exactly and how we keep the balance between our very basic needs and something that it's almost like a sickness. I'm sure that the old folk, people from many, many years ago, they remember this, I'm going many, many, many years ago. Um, you remember those days that people were standing in line outside of the bank four times a year with the recorded checkbooks in January, in April, in July, in October, it was a long line outside of the bank. And they go to the bank manager one time and ask a question, how come it's a long line of people standing outside? You remember those days? So, it tells you all, oh, you know, people want to check their interest on their saving account in the books. So wait a second, let me ask you a question. Yes. You mean to say that the bank will not give them their interest for the money? No, no, he said, for sure we give them the interest. So how come there is a long line? He says, oh, you don't know how it works. And the people's psyche and the people's mindset, they would like to see in their account that they gain on the interest 
$147.23, meaning that's additional money to the bank account because this is wealth, is, is, is the money itself, by itself. And that's the psyche, that is the is a view that some people hold that it's it's the what I gain out of that, the interest that coming out, that's give people sign of either pleasure or power. But there is another school of thought, you see it among the commentators, that said that it's not the money itself, it's the pleasure that comes with the money. Here are some psukim on chapter two. King Solomon said, Baniti li batim, I build homes, I build palaces. Natati kramim, I planted a lot of um, vineyards. Ganotu pardesim, orchards. And the list goes on and on. Those who have the book with them, you can see on verse uh, four, and then the following verse, Higdalti maasai, I increase so much wealth, and, and I uh, not only building builded houses, I planted vineyards, I made for myself gardens and orchards and planted them in every kind of food trees. I constructed pools from which to irrigate a grove of, of young trees. I brought in those days, I brought slaves, male and female slaves, and the list go on and on and on. So Sharim Vesharot, I have a choir, I have all this point that makes money as a pleasure, right? Money as a pleasure. So money by pleasure, there is a danger there. The rabbi said, ha'ayin ro'ah chomed, meaning the I see and the heart desire. So every day on Shema, we have a parashat tzitzit, we have the last part of Shema, and we are saying, Velo taturu acharei levavchem veacharei einechem. You should not cover it. The way that goes is you see it in your eyes, then your hearts feel I need it, and then you just follow that path. So here we describe it. He said, Shida veshidot. Shida veshidot. Uh, Rashi explained that that's. Those days was chariots and horses. Nowadays, it's like all these luxury cars. Ibn Ezra have a more radical interpretation. And he said that's pilagshim. He has a concubine, like women for pleasure. So he said, more than anybody else in Yerushalayim, more than I, I, my eye desire, I have everything I wish to. So what happened? The Torah tells us, you should be careful with that. Why? That's the last one in the Ten Commandments. You should not covet. Because let's talk a little bit about uh, advertisement or sales. What happened with sales? They approach all these social media, let's say television, or whatever it is, and you see constantly a commercial advertisement. So what's the secret of advertising? They, they tell you that you need it, you absolutely need it to enhance your life, to make you happier. That's the, all the time the ideas. And you don't know what you miss if you don't have that. And it gives you the kind of idea in your mind that that's eventually will somehow makes you happier. And King Solomon called it, Hakol Hevel Ruach. The word Hevel repeats so many times in the book. Hevel, in the art school, they translate it as a, a fruit art. I like Rabbi Sachs, may rest in peace, interpretation in the Quran. He used it like the brother of Cain or Cain, or like the idea of Hevel that comes out of our mouth, that it's like air, that it's almost like vanity, meaningless, that it doesn't carry anything. So here you see a huge difference between the approach of the wealthier person versus a someone with a need. Let's think together. You approach a very poor person and you said to him or her, I'm going to give you a new car. 
So that person will be is probably uh, happy. And if you tell him or her, look, I'm going to give you a bigger house or give you an apartment or house. So at least the poor person have in his or her mind that that will make me happier versus the wealthy. The wealthy person is so happy that he's like heaven would walk. It's meaningless. So, well, how good? So you see here the dynamics. In one hand, he called it in a time that he was wealthy. That is a heaven, that it's ruach, that it's meaningless. Then later on, he said, hakesef ya'ane takol. Hakesef ya'ane takol, meaning money, you can get anything you wish to. Money can get anything. So the, the, the Mepharshim, the commentators, have a, um, several ideas what King Solomon meant by that. There are those Mepharshim that said that it was a sarcastic um, point of view because even the wealthiest person have certain limitations. Going back many, many years ago, it was a fellow that had only one child um, and uh, he worked very, very hard from almost nothing to gain wealth. And they made beautiful um, uh, celebration of his son's bar mitzvah. And while they celebrated their uh, bar mitzvah, and each plate was at least uh, 150, 200 dollars a person. Um, he turned to the host. He said, oh, I see that everybody enjoyed the food. You don't eat anything. So he looked and he said, Rabbi, don't you know? I have a esophagus issue. So I can't touch food. Now, think about it. This person, in the early part of his life, his dream, he said, to have steak at least for Shabbat, at least once a week. His wishes is that I'm going to work hard. And one day he said, I'm going to have a steak for Shabbat, for the weekend, I'm going to eat steak. Now he works so hard for all these years, it's a big celebration. And he's not only cannot eat steak on Shabbat, he wish he have the money to eat steaks every day, but instead, he cannot eat any food. He is so restricted that he can only drink a certain liquid, etc., etc. A severe issue with his esophagus that just happened recently. So here is the idea of hakesef yane takol. In one hand, you work hard and you accomplish your dreams, and then all of a sudden, you don't have your wishes when it time for you to enjoy what you work hard, all of a sudden is not there. So it's kind of interesting dynamic. The Sephorno, this is one of the commentators, try to tell us what does that mean when King Solomon used the term hakesef yane takol. Hakesef yane takol, meaning money can answer everything. He said, don't take it uh, literally positively. He said, kesef shel shochad vechemdat mamon. Sephora so explained to us that money can give everything, meaning money corrupts. Money, he used the term money corrupts government, money corrupts people. Money is the source of corruption. So here we talk about social justice or, or government or um, behavior toward people, people behave toward each other. So a kesef yane takod that money can answer everything is kind of very sensitive dynamic of understanding. And now we, are, we grasp the idea of the contradiction that it's not really a contradiction within the Kohelet. It's a fascinating view how you treated the idea of wealth. Another good example, and just try to be a practical in all the interpretation, Let's talk a social medicine. We are living in a modern world and look what happened. If you have enough assets, if you have enough money, so you can, as Rashi said, that's the reality. You can go ahead and if you need uh, a surgery, can have it right away versus someone who 
cannot afford, so he or she can wait in line for weeks, sometimes months, to um, to get a very basic uh, surgery or other needs. You can see in hospitals. If you have the money, you can have your own room. Versus you go to many hospitals. I have the privilege to do biku hauling to visit people, and you see, unfortunately, people um, who are like waiting for hours to get to one of the rooms, and meanwhile they are in a hallway waiting. Yes, is in chapter ten, but you see it in other sources in the book of um, Kohelet. So here, with that mindset of what happened to people who have no money versus people who have wealth is a discussion in the Talmud based on those statements in the Kohelet. What's better? Imagine a group of rabbis many years ago have this discussion that it's fascinating to think that so many years later, it's very applicable to us today. And the rabbi said, let's think together. What's better, to be extremely wealthy or to be extremely poor? And the rabbis vote for what? I'm sure you guess by now, for poverty. Meaning, we in, <laughs> in Judaism, we encourage people to have wealth, to have money. But if the destiny, if it's in our control, the destiny of a person, the test, the trials and tribulations of the wealthy, it's, it's much serious, it's much severer than the indigent. And therefore, the Rambam explained to us, we all familiar with the concept of Shvila Zahab. The Rambam said, when you see a tree that is leaning to one direction and you want to straighten it out, you just move the tree the other way and then the tree will get the proper balance. So here King Solomon said, Tob yeled misken vechacham. He said, chokhmata misken bzuya. So the idea is that people who have wealth, they feel sometimes a little arrogant or condescending or controlling, and they can manipulate or control um, other people. And as a result, you see in a society a, a dragging down of values. Once I heard a story from uh, the great Rabbi Beryl Wein, Robert Bellwine is a world-renowned uh, Tamil Chacham, scholar, and more. Uh, so he is a yeshiva in New York. And years back, he uh, one time received a phone call from a fellow that considered one of the wealthy of the wealthy in the uh, world, the Jewish world. And he said, I would like to have my son uh, enroll in your yeshiva. And Rabbi Wine said to him, oh, it will be our pleasure. We're going to mail you all the papers and all the applications. And um, we'll see, uh, uh, we will consider, you know, maybe to have your child. But then the fellow interrupted the conversation and says, Rabbi Wine, I want you to know in advance, there is a little condition here. If you accept my son, my son to you, you yeshiva, I'm telling you right now, you're not going to get for me a penny more than the basic tuition, just the tuition. And wait, don't even ask me for a building fund to have a dinner, to give you names of my friends or anything else. So Rabbi Ryan said to him, so don't you know that there is yeshiva around? Why do you choose mine? Don't you know, so he said, I'll be honest with you. Unfortunately, no one treat my child as a normal child. He said, he cannot, my child cannot get a normal education. My child enrolled in several yeshivas in several schools and they used and in a way even abused the idea that he is the only child I have exploited, they exploit him for their benefit. And because of that, I know it, my child know it. That's the reason why I said what I said. So now you think about it. You have people who are extremely 
wealthy billionaires. Some of them are charitable, but many of them, you see the attitude that they, it's never enough, that they always strive to get more. There's, there's no balance in their mind. And that's what they said in the Kohelet, Ohev Kesef, Lo Yisba Kesef. Someone who loves money, so never say she never be satisfied. Always want to get more money and more money, and more money. Let's be honest. We have few rabbanim here, so I ask my friends and my colleagues a simple question. Let's say you call somebody in the middle of the night. You said, "Hey, fellow, I have an excellent deal for you. It can be a business deal, real estate deal." It's the middle of the night, but you're going to get, make tons of money. He is ready and willing to do it. But if you call someone in the middle of the night and said, I have a mitzvah for you. I need you tomorrow for the minion. I have a mitzvah for you. I need you tomorrow to join me to visit someone. All of a sudden, not everyone will be enthusiastic to do it, right? So here is the beauty of this writing. It said that it's okay to earn money. It's okay to yearn to have money. But in chapter five, he tells us that the avada ra'u ve'ainyan ara. So it, it means he asks question: When is enough? When exactly you tell me that you have enough? Because if you go by the Rambam, he speaks about balance. So he said et asher yechsar lo. Meaning, for some people, it's not enough because they get used to a certain lifestyle and it's very hard for them to change their lifestyle. The Talmud relate to us a story of Hillel. Hillel was by himself was far away from wealth, but he was a caring, tremendously caring person. So unfortunately, in the community, it was a wealthy individual that lost his wealth. And everyone tried to help him and, and buy him clothing and buy him uh, whatever he needs for his life. Uh, one of the things is a, a horse. In those days, nowadays is a car, and those days was a horse. So the Talmud relate to us and said, you know, that fellow um, need a horse, they get him a horse. But then someone need to lead the horse. And Hillel was in search to find someone. He couldn't find anybody. So Hillel himself led the horse because that's what's called the Sharia Sometimes there are people who get used to a certain lifestyle and they are ready to commit suicide, God forbid. And they are ready to be totally on medication and down depressed because something went down not the way that they used to. And that's what King Solomon tried to teach us. It's called Galgala Choser. Galgala Choser is almost like turn around pyramid, like roller coaster. Sometimes at the top, sometimes at the bottom, sometimes in the middle. That's the idea. In one hand, Ani Chashub Kemet, someone who is indigent, he or she don't see a, a, a vow of his life. But unlike uh, Christianity, particularly Catholicism, if they have this well-known vow of poverty, we do not hold that way. We said, no, we are for wealth, but it has to be in a way um, in balance. So take, in, just as another example, a practical life of children, some of the children of people who are wealthy. Many of you may know that those private schools there are some children who come with the bodyguards. So imagine you reach all this wealth. And the next thing you need to do is to pay for a bodyguard to watch over your child in his or her school. Another wrong conception that King Solomon tried to teach us is something that's very different than a civil law. In a civil law, you can have it by uh, all the legal documentation. Um, we use the term almost like controlling from the grave, that you can write down whatever you wish to happen after you're no longer among the living. And then you expect in the second, sometimes third, sometimes fourth, fifth generation along the line to follow the way you're expecting them to follow. But it's good and well by civil law. 
In Judaism is no such a thing. And that's a beautiful statement in chapter five that King Solomon said, Yesh ra'ah shira'iti tachad ha'shemesh. There is, he used the word ra'ah. Ra'ah can be evil or disturbed that I see under the sun. Never enough. That a person, lotis ba osher, that he's never happy. Et asher yiten lo Hashem, whatever the Almighty gives the person. Osher un chasin vechavod venenu chaser lenafsho. The Almighty gives the person wealth and honor. Mikol asher yitave, whatever he wish to happen, he, he, he accumulates all of that. And then all of a sudden, he's gone. I know a case of a person that works so hard. Yes, it's also in chapter six and onward. A person that works very, very hard. And all of a sudden, when he reaches a point that he can retire, he's no longer among the living. And he used here the word that is so painful. He used the word, ve'ish acher yochlenu. Ve'ish acher yochlenu, or ish nochri yochlenu. Ish nochri yochlenu. Nochri is almost like a foreigner. What does that mean? You walk hard on the well, and now all of a sudden, guess what happened? Somebody else drives the benefit from that. Meaning, another person can be to the extreme, the, the government, the maid, or, and they do whatever they want, or it can happen that his own child, um, those things are very different than their father wished to. So in a way, King Solomon warns people and said, the Almighty showed people from, you know, the way he conducted the world, that um, if you know what's going to happen to this wealth, you may change your decisions at this uh, time. The Rambam derived from that. A person should always feel, in Ilho Teshuvah, the Rambam said, that a person should feel, today it may be my last day. So if it's my last day, I have to make decisions that make sense. Why? Because it can be so different than I thought, that I anticipated. Here was a, another example of a fellow, works very, very hard. He starts from very scratch, very basic um, way of living, and he never took vacations. He works hard, he was by himself, um, only one son, his wife was gone along, and um, right after he passed away, he went and asked a question, um, where can I say Kaddish in Himalaya? Himalaya is uh, close to Nepal, it's very far away, and the question is, um, why do you need to say Kaddish in Himalaya? It turns out that all these millions of dollars the father left him, he's now going to have fun and traveling around the world with that blood money. So he wants to know if he can say Kaddish in Himalaya. Now, if you see the situation, you're very close to say to him, you know, if your father knew what you're doing with his money, he would turn his grave five times, right? But the the um, sometimes is a hell by all means King Solomon said to the wealthy that you work so hard and especially if it's a blood money and then all of a sudden somebody else used the word nochri nochri literally it's a foreigner but the way the mefarshim tells us it can be that would be your own child your own grandchild that they make decisions to do things that is a opposite in all the hard labors of so many years. So he called it here, Osher Hashamu Lib Alav Ra'ato, that sometimes wealth can turn around against the wishes of a person itself. So in some uh, Jewish schools, there is an attitude based on that, that it's called Hishamu Bibnei Aniyim Shemehem Tetzet Torah. That the um, the private uh, Jewish day school, many schools, they make decisions that X percentage of children should go by the um, uh, scholarship because they understood that the the if it's just a, a country club for the rich, the level of education will be different than 
if you take children from a family that cannot afford Jewish education, but um, you incorporate them so the learning will be more a, a, in the spirit of the Torah and mitzvot and then fulfillment of what we are all about. Now, this is one extreme that King Solomon described, that people are so down depressed and uh, either by the wrong decisions or the wrong circumstance that even the our people were even considering taking away their lives. Um, but there is a another sign. He called it the Ashirim Bashefel Yeshvu, the Avada in Aosher Auba in Yanara, the Envy Adom and Uma. In Solomon here, talk about the period of time that he lost everything. And he described a situation when a person gets used to certain lifestyle and certain wealth. And imagine the children, everyone expecting something, and all of a sudden, wrong decision or situations that wasn't expected and everything is gone. That individual will feel complete failure. There's a strong feeling that there's nothing I, I can leave for my kids. There's nothing there with all my hard work for so many years. So that's what it means when he said we need to know the status at all, the, the, the full picture in order to understand, like we use the term of Hillel and his horse, you remember, that we need to know what's the situation in full to value and, and be a sort of help. So what we learn, we learn that there is a will of life and is Galgala Chodzer, that is sometimes a turning point around. And in Yiddish you said, Mensch tracht and God lacht that people make some efforts and God sitting there in our language and making fun of us. So in that sense, when you see people go to an attorney and said, I, I want to have a will, make sure that my great, great grandchildren will be protected. You have people like that. They want to make sure uh, that everything goes well four, five, six generations from now. The truth is, who can tell you that that's going to happen and vice versa? So Ibn Ezra tells us a famous statement. He says, Adam do'eg al ibud damav ve'ino do'eg al ibud yamav. A person is worried about losing money and he's not worried about losing his days. Damav chozrim, yamav einam chozrim. Money can come and go. Time, when it's gone, it's over cannot bring back time. So therefore, a person should always think, what is the goal? What, why I'm living here? What's my purpose? The Mishnah said in Avot, you accumulate wealth, you can accumulate also worry. You need to take care of the insurance, you need to take care of the uh, people in taxes to do, give you consulting. You need to be a consultant of the constant, uh, how the business will run. So the, the King Solomon said, metukash nata oved is sweet. When the, someone walks hard and simple, he sleep well. The hasava, hasava lo maniach, lo lishon. When he's a wealthy person, because he has properties and because he has uh, stocks and so many other things, that doesn't let, doesn't give him a chance to sleep peacefully because there's so much to worry. So uh, again, if you, you, you know that, and you know that people who accumulate such extreme wealth and they need to protect their children in school, they need to go with bodyguards, that's in a way diminish your desire to reach that level of wealth. And this is something that we can derive from this learning. It's not really a contradiction in the book of Kohelet. It's another example that Osher Hashamur Ba'alav Lera'ato, Ibn Ezra explained to us, wealth come with a tremendous downside. Um, so again, we're not preaching to be poor, but to achieve balance. And Rashi explained to us, where is the wisdom? There is a wealth. What does that mean? Rashi said, together with money, you can get wisdom. So simply speaking, you have money, you can hire teachers, you can pay for education, you can have all the 
needs in order to, to eventually stand on your feet or your child, etc., etc. Ibn Ezra, uh, Ibn Ezra's life was a life in poverty, but he explained that the the betzela chokma, betzela kesef, the wisdom can lead to money. He said, "How good is it if someone have money without wisdom?" The our people, yeah, chapter five, verse twelve. Thank you. The the our people who are um, gain wealth and lose it the same day, the same time, just because they don't have the wisdom. If you have a wisdom. And then you have the experience, then you can use the wealth and direct it properly so it will not only perpetuate, but also bring interest. But if you give a fool, if you give someone who's not the moron, right, you give him wealth, the next thing that happened that is a tremendous mistake and a great loss. So what we see here, that it's a, um, uh, the subject of contradiction in the book of Kohelet is not a really a uh, contradiction, it's just lead us to keep balance in life. Wealth we use just as an example. Um, because running uh, out of time, I just give you another point, which is Shomer Pihu, how we should conduct our mouth properly. And again, there are different uh, views and different contra uh, contra apparent controversy, uh, controversy in the text but it's not. So he basically said that a person should use his mouth to um, create happiness and create um, a healing and blessing to other people. So sometimes the, the rabbis derive from that, that when we say to someone, great to see you, how are you today? Just say healing words, just say words that brings some type of hope to people. It can even change the destiny. Um, using just as an example, it was a time that we play basketball at the JCC. It was a fellow that used to come there every day for himself, never talk to anybody, look very down. I, I just have the privilege to say, good to see you, good morning, how are you? Every time just greeted him nicely. And years later, he came for the inauguration of the um, um, new day school. And he said, do you remember me? I'm Dov. And he introduced his wife and a child. And then he said, you know, what gives me life for a long time, I didn't want to wake up in the morning. I didn't want to go to play um, and to the gym. But I knew that I'm going to meet you. And I didn't even know that you are a rabbi. And I knew I meet somebody who said to me, oh, so great to see you. He says, because nobody wants to see me. I was born and raised in a, in a project. Since I was 14, I have nothing in life. And you came there and said to me every day, so great to see you. He says, this give me hope, give me life. So sometimes King Solomon said here that healing words can heal people's soul. And we sometimes underestimate our capability by saying something nice to somebody. Just that just instead of holding those words, just saying something that gives them a hope that can uh, totally change people's uh, uh, destiny. So I see that we're almost running out of time. I just want to conclude with something that he said also in the book of Proverbs. And he said, a gentle tongue brings healing. And when we think about healing, that's one of the key ideas in the book of Kohelet. Uh, many times we think of praying for people for healing. And yes, that's one way. But what I want uh, us to think is the word of uh, healing that Solomon repairs. Which meaning when you're kind, when you are encouraging, when you don't just think something good, but you verbalize it, you are being a real healer, King Solomon said. And it's amazing what one kind of words, healing words can do to people. We don't uh, think anything about it, but to the other person, it brings uh, life to their spirit. And yes, that's my last word for today. And you're welcome to ask me questions. Somebody today needs your healing words. Somebody won't get past the depression without you speaking blessing over them. They will get to talk out of all the good future just because somebody said something that hurts their feeling and they carry that hurt. So we have a call, especially at this time, to be the healer.
we um, use those words that he repeated himself also in Proverbs 18. He said, our words can be a life-giving water. So, and there are too many people out there that they are tremendously thirsty. They've gone through a hard uh, breaks the situations. They are being beaten down uh, many times verbally in life. And we have something to offer them. Our words can help heal the hurts. So be aware um, who is in your life and be sensitive to what you are feeling in your heart of hearts and take time to let people know that you really care for them because those healing words um, um, can change our world and bring it to the real tikkun olam. I'm here uh, to serve you and to ask to answer all any questions you have. And thank you for listening. I'm willing and ready to answer any question you have at this time. You Go can uh, put uh, comments in the chat or questions, or if you want to give a shot at unmuting you yourself, you can. Uh, I, I was going to mention just uh, a, a source related story about basketball, Rabbi Weisboom. Uh, the teaching of uh, Shammai in Pirkei Avot, Havei Mekabel et Kol Adam Besever Panim Yafot. So always uh, receive people uh, with a, a pleasant, pleasing view and how, how it changes personal dynamics just to communicate to a person that you're happy to see. Right. Brad Levy has a question. Oh, yes. How, how might how, we compare these teachings to Buddhism, which also works towards striving for the middle way? Excellent. So, again, this is not the study of comparative religion, but the story of, of uh, the Buddha and the state of exclusion for seven years and coming back with a uh, four level of truth, which is actually eight level of truth, is a, uh, the idea of the impermanency of, of life. So uh, much earlier than the uh, Buddhism, you have the Rambam's teaching that speaks about it. But yes, you can find a similarity to that teaching. The only difference is that Buddhism, um, in a way, it's a little bit myopic. It's uh, circumscribed the, the um, level of nirvana, the level of getting to the point of uh, highest being by uh, following the idea of a level of truth. Judaism in the level of mitzvot and deeds ask you not only to be in a state of cleansing and reach nirvana, but to be super active and to really change the world, tikkun olam, to make the world a better place to live. So yes, you can use some terms in Buddhism that is a very similar to Judaism, but uh, Judaism is a way richer and broader and gives you way more depth of uh, meaning of life, not just in the sense of philosophy and theology, but practically speaking, happy life can happen with much better tools in Judaism. I may add to that just another point that I, I mentioned earlier. Uh, we talk about uh, healing words. So Buddhism said that you should um, um, uh, part of the idea of life is the suffering. If you read the literature of Buddhism, they're speaking about birth is suffering, death is suffering, and life is suffering when the Buddha came back and he saw the suffering, which he didn't see when he lived in a palace. It was a very hard for him to comprehend this type of, uh, of life and more. But um, Buddhism is not speaking so much about the active part of Tikkun Olam. Uh, we say that um, active part is, for example, everyone uh, needs encouragement. We say that everyone needs somebody that cheering them all. That's Judaism, somebody that sees the best. And that's the beauty of Judaism. We can expand on that and say you can be that person for the people in your life. You can be the one that they count on, the one that doesn't find faults, the one that uh, has the healing words, the words that uplift, words that encourage, and all these compliments are the glue that hold the relationship together. And they have enough people already that pushing them down, um, people ac accuse other people and not always true. And Judaism ask, ask, why don't you use your words to build them up, to tell them that what they can become, to make them feel better about themselves. 
Buddhism don't ask you to go out of your way to do such an physical actions, even with words that make tikkun olam. It's a religion that speaks about the beauty of understanding suffering, the uh, importance of understanding the impermanency of life, but they're not going to the level of asking you to act actively doing Torah and mitzvot. Thank you for the question. It was a great question. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. You're very welcome. Thank you, Rabbi Noah, Rabbi Scott, and all the Rabbi and all the Rabbanim and all the Tamidei Chachamim. May this festival of Sukkot, we are commended. This is the only time in our Torah that the Torah commanded us to be besimcha, to be happy. And it's uh, in the book of Kohelet, seven times King Solomon used the word simcha, happy. Simcha is not only ashrei yoshrei vitecha, to be just happy, it's to have the joy to, to see the half glass feel, to see the beauty of our lives, to, to see the beauty of our world, to give yourself and other people hope. That's what uh, the festival of Sukkot is all about. So I want to wish you and your families uh, yeah, not only Chag Sameach and wonderful uh, festival of Sukkot, but I want to wish you a continuing of a great year. May the Almighty God bring peace to your heart, peace to your home, peace in Israel, peace in the world. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, very much. thank you so much. And thank you to everybody who joined us. We're going to send out a link to the video of this program in case you missed anything or if you would like to share the video with others. And thank you to our sponsors who we named at the beginning of the webinar. And we will also share again in the chat. Finally, I just want to remind everybody we have an upcoming event, an upcoming webinar on November 7th and 21st at 7 p.m. called The Rhetoric of the Jewish Liturgy with Professor Rabbi Ruben Kimmelman. You'll be able to register for that event using the link that we are about to share in the chat. I'm going to share that now with you. If you'd like to register for that and learn more about that event, go to that link. And thank you again for joining us. Thank you. Have a great day, everybody. You too. Thanks, Amir. Thanks, Amir. Thanks, Amir.